Daniel's 70th week prophecy, part 3. What must come before the 70th week? How, when, and what? How will it happen? When will it happen? And what will occur during? Chapter 3, Obscure Prophecies That We Typically Forget About. In this chapter, we'll have a reminder of what the purposes of the 70th week of Daniel are. We'll discuss about the oracles against Damascus, the oracles against Egypt, <laughs> damn that Nile, the oracle against Elam, wherever that is, and Israel finding oil. <laughs> Things are moving very quickly in the news these days. <laughs> Oops, why am I jumping ahead to Chapter 4's topic here in Chapter 3? If you've been watching my presentation, I was going to focus on the beast and his treaty here in Chapter 3. But things are moving so quickly that I felt I needed to jump ahead to focus on a few key prophecies that could be near fulfillment right now. The headlines in the news are full of stories about Syria, Iran, and Egypt, and the tumult of the Middle East. And as of this writing, on September 10, 2013, Syria is in danger of, quote, being punished by the U.S. and its allies for using chemical weapons on its citizens. However, President Obama first wants to see if Assad will give up his chemical stockpile to Russia, let me say that again, Russia, to dispose of before he decides to actually attack. Huh. On another front, Egypt is about to come unglued with civil strife due to the military's coup against President Morsi. And Iran is still developing its nuclear program and meddling in Syria's affairs. And both Syria and Iran are threatening to, quote, take out Tel Aviv, unquote, in Israel if America should do anything against Syria. So what does the Bible have to say about this, if anything? But before we jump into those prophecies, I want to provide a reminder of the purposes of Daniel's 70th week. As found in Daniel 9.24, quote, Seventy sevens are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place, unquote. In his interpretation of the message, the angel wanted Daniel to understand why God had put the 70 weeks timeline into place, and they are important to note. First, to finish transgression within God's people, the Jews. Second, to put an end to sin in the world of the Gentiles, the non-Jews. Third, to atone for wickedness. God's wrath will be kindled against mankind and all sinful creation. Fourth, to bring in everlasting righteousness. The Messiah will come to rule and reign. And fifth, to seal up all vision and prophecy. All of the prophecies in the Bible will be fulfilled to the letter. And finally, to anoint the most holy place. The millennial temple will be consecrated at the end of this 70-week prophecy and this begins the thousand-year messianic kingdom. The fifth reason the angel gave to Daniel for the 70th week of Daniel was to seal up all vision and prophecy. There are several very important yet obscure prophecies that need to be fulfilled prior to or just after the 70th week of Daniel begins. And just as Yeshua, Jesus the Messiah, fulfilled over 300 prophecies to the letter in his first coming, there will be literally hundreds of prophecies fulfilled between now and the end of the age. And I want to focus on a few key ones that are currently in the news. The Oracles Against Damascus has found in Isaiah 17, 1-3 in the New International Version. A prophecy against Damascus. See, Damascus will no longer be a city, but will become a heap of ruins. The cities of Aror 
will be deserted and left to flocks, which will lie down with no one to make them afraid. The fortified city will disappear from Ephraim, and royal power or sovereignty from Damascus, and the remnant of Aram or Syria will be like the departed glory of the Israelites, declares the Lord Almighty. A brief note. It appears that when Damascus will, quote, no longer be a city, unquote, also the, quote, fortified city or fortress will disappear from Ephraim, unquote. According to Isaiah, Israel will not be unscathed when Damascus is destroyed. Could it be that Syria, Iran, and Hezbollah will actually retaliate against Israel should America or the West attack Syria for its use of chemical weapons? And could this then result in Israel responding to utterly obliterate Damascus? We may soon find out. There are two other oracles against Damascus. The first is found in Jeremiah 49:24 through 27. Verse 24. Damascus has become feeble. She has turned to flee, and panic has gripped her. Anguish and pain have seized her, pain like that of a woman in labor. Why has the city of renown not been abandoned, the town in which I delight? Surely her young men will fall in the streets. All her soldiers will be silenced in that day, declares the Lord Almighty. I will set fire to the walls of Damascus. It will consume the fortresses or palaces of Ben-Hadad. And the Amplified Version adds that Ben-Hadad is the title of several kings of Syria. The next oracle is found in Amos 1, 3 through 5, verse 3. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Damascus, even for four, I will not relent, because she threshed Gilead with sledges having iron teeth. I will send fire on the house of Haziel that will consume the fortresses of Ben-Hadad. I will break down the gate of Damascus. I will destroy the king who is in the valley of Avon, and the one who holds the scepter of Beth Eden. The people of Aram will go into exile to Kur, says the Lord. So here's a brief history of Damascus. Damascus, Syria is known as the longest occupied city in history. And here is a brief history from LonelyPlanet.com. Quote, Damascus lays a strong claim to being the oldest continuously inhabited city in the world. Hieroglyphic tablets found in Egypt makes reference to Damascus as one of the cities conquered by the Egyptians in the 15th century BC. But excavations from the courtyard of the Umayyad Mosque have yielded finds dating back to the 3rd millennium BC. The name Damascus appears in the Ebla archives and also on tablets found at Mari dating from 2500 BC. With the coming of Islam, Damascus became an important center as the seat of the Umayyad Caliphate from 661 to 750. When the Abbasids took over and moved the Caliphate to Baghdad, Damascus was plundered once again." Unquote. Damascus may have been plundered, but it has never fully been destroyed, nor has it ever been uninhabited. So here is a current map of Syria. And here is Damascus, the longest occupied city in history. So what becomes of Syria? As seen from the oracles of Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Amos, Damascus is a city ripe for the judgment of God. From ancient times, Damascus has oppressed and killed God's holy people. And in the last few decades, Syria has sponsored Hezbollah, the Lebanese terrorist organization, to conduct terrorist activities and has participated with them against Israel, America, and the West.
And as I mentioned in my last video, I contend that Syria is one of the nations that the beast, quote, plucks up, unquote, prior to his taking control of the final eight-nation beast empire. So, either by the hand of God, the bombs of Israel, or the forces of the future Antichrist, Syria is going to be destroyed, and Damascus will be utterly obliterated, and the sovereignty of the nation lost. So I ask you, please pray for the Syrians to come to know Yeshua Jesus as Savior and Lord, and to flee Damascus before that day. So what's this thing about Ephraim? Isaiah 17.3 says, quote, The fortified city, or fortress, will disappear from Ephraim, unquote. Not only does Isaiah 17 tell of the total destruction of Damascus, but there is a city in Israel, in the ancient region of Ephraim specifically, that will likewise be destroyed. Damascus will, quote, cease being a city, and the royal power from Damascus will disappear, unquote, while a fortified city, or merely a fortress, will be destroyed in Israel. But there will be, quote, gleanings, unquote, left, as found in Isaiah 17.6, so it will not utterly be obliterated. It so happens that the largest city in Israel that happens to be in the ancient Ephraimite area happens to be Tel Aviv. This is the city most nations recognize today as Israel's capital. And this is why I ask, if Syria and Iran destroy Tel Aviv, doesn't it make sense for Israel to retaliate with as much force as it deems necessary to answer this aggression, perhaps leading to the total destruction of Damascus? So here is a map of the ancient region of Ephraim. The city of Joppa or as it is known today as Jaffa, it was an ancient port city thought to have originally have been a Phoenician port since it was not part of the Philistine kingdom. And most maps place Jaffa in Dan, but it later became part of Ephraim when much of the tribe of Dan moved north. Well, it just so happens that this is where the modern city of Tel Aviv is located, and it is recognized by most nations as Israel's capital city. And is this the, quote, fortified city, unquote, that Isaiah is speaking of in Isaiah 17.3 that gets destroyed? Hmm. Well, both Syria and Iran have said that they will attack Tel Aviv should America and the West attack Syria. The oracle against Egypt is found in Isaiah 19, 1 through 8. Verse 1, a prophecy against Egypt. See, the Lord rides on a swift cloud and is coming to Egypt. The idols of Egypt tremble before him, and the hearts of the Egyptians will melt with fear. I will stir up Egyptian against Egyptian. Brother will fight against brother. Neighbor against neighbor, city against city, kingdom against kingdom. The Egyptians will lose heart and I will bring their plans to nothing. They will consult the idols and the spirits of the dead, the mediums and the spiritists. I will hand the Egyptians over to the power of a cruel master, and a fierce king will rule over them, declares the Lord, the Lord Almighty. The waters of the river will dry up, and the riverbed will be parched and dry. The canals will stink. The streams of Egypt will dwindle and dry up. The reeds and rushes will wither. Also the plants along the Nile, at the mouth of the river, every sown field along the Nile will become parched, will blow away and be no more. The fishermen will groan and lament. All who cast hooks into the Nile, those who throw nets on the water will pine away. Wow! That is a judgment against Egypt. There are three key points in Isaiah's oracle against Egypt that I want to address here, two of which are in process right now. The first one is, I will stir up Egyptian against Egyptian. 
There is currently an almost even split between those who support the Muslim Brotherhood and those who support the military's actions to remove President Morsi and his Brotherhood allies from power. They are literally on the verge of civil war as of this writing. And if I'm not mistaken, this is the first time in Egypt's history that this has happened this way, since usually the military and authoritarian government has prevented this from getting out of hand in the past. The second thing that's happening is found in verse 6, here in the New International Version. The canals will stink. The streams of Egypt will dwindle and dry up. The reeds and rushes will wither. Interestingly, the King James Version says it a bit differently. Here it is, Isaiah 19.6 in the King James Version. Quote, and they shall turn the rivers far away, and the brooks of defense shall be emptied and dried up. The reeds and flags shall wither. Unquote. Emphasis mine. Well, who are the they, and could they really affect the course of the Nile River and cause it to dry up? The they. Ethiopia is the they. And they are planning on building the Grand Millennium Dam, or the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, as it has now been renamed, across the Blue Nile River, which supplies about 80% of the water for the Nile River in Egypt. And they began diverting the Blue Nile in May 2013, just a few months ago, for the project. And here is a brief article from the National Geographic website by Kerr Thon from July 2011. At a public ceremony in March, Ethiopian Prime Minister Meles Zenawi laid the cornerstone for the new dam, a hydroelectric power plant that will span a section of the Blue Nile River in the country's Benishangul Gumuz region. The Blue Nile originates in Ethiopia's Lake Tana and is one of two major tributaries of the Nile, the world's longest river. When completed in 2015, the Grand Millennium Dam will be the largest hydroelectric power plant in Africa, and it will also create the country's largest artificial lake with a capacity of 63 billion cubic meters of water, twice the size of Lake Tana in Ethiopia's Amhara region. The Blue Nile River and White Nile River both feed the Single Nile River in Egypt and they merge, as you can see, in Khartoum, Sudan. The headwaters of the Blue Nile River are in Ethiopia and supplies nearly 80% of the water of the Single Nile River in Egypt. Ethiopia began to divert the Blue Nile River in May 2013 to begin construction on the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam to be completed in 2015. Something happens during this construction to virtually dry up Egypt's portion of the river. <laughs> and to think that Isaiah prophesied this over 2,500 years ago. With two of the three points of Isaiah's oracle against Egypt being in process right now, let's discuss the third one, and it is found in verse 4. I will hand the Egyptians over to the power of a cruel master, and a fierce king will rule over them. In Daniel 11.40-43, it speaks of a future battle where Egypt, the king of the south, attacks the king of the north, Turkey, and is defeated. Starting in verse 40, And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him. The king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind, with chariots and with horsemen, and with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries, and shall overflow and pass over. He shall enter also into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon, i.e. the nation of Jordan. He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver and over all the precious things of Egypt and the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. As I contend in my previous video, this quote king of the north, unquote, is the leader of the final eight-nation beast empire, who will come and utterly destroy Egypt and leave them humiliated and subjugated under his power.
And I believe this happens before the 70th week of Daniel begins and before the seven-year peace treaty is signed. So with two of the three points being fulfilled right now, could this third point be just around the corner? <laughs> well, if you've seen my other videos, you will see that this could happen real soon. So what becomes of Egypt? Egypt will be divided, dried up, and destroyed. But Isaiah's oracle continues in Isaiah 19, 18 through 22. Verse 18, In that day shall five cities in the land of Egypt speak the language of Canaan, and swear to the Lord of hosts, one shall be called the city of destruction. In that day shall there be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt, and a pillar at the border thereof to the Lord. And it shall be for a sign and for a witness unto the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. For they shall cry unto the Lord because of the oppressors, and he shall send them a Savior, and a great one, and he shall deliver them. And the Lord shall be known to Egypt, and the Egyptians shall know the Lord in that day, and shall do sacrifice and oblation, yea, they shall vow a vow unto the Lord and perform it. And the Lord shall smite Egypt, he shall smite and heal it. And they shall return even to the Lord, and he shall be entreated of them, and shall heal them. The remnant from Egypt will come to know Yeshua Jesus as Messiah and Lord. They will become his people, and he will become their God. The Oracle Against Elam Elam is not mentioned in the Bible, but a few times. However, Jeremiah proclaims an oracle against Elam that takes place in the last days that we need to pay attention to. So here it is in Jeremiah 49, 34 through 39. Verse 34. This is the word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah the prophet concerning Elam early in the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah. This is what the Lord Almighty says. See, I will break the bow of Elam, the mainstay of their might. I will bring against Elam the four winds from the four quarters of heaven. I will scatter them to the four winds, and there will not be a nation where Elam's exiles do not go. I will shatter Elam before their foes, before those who want to kill them. I will bring disaster on them, even my fierce anger declares the Lord. I will pursue them with the sword until I have made an end of them. I will set my throne in Elam and destroy her king and officials, declares the Lord. Yet I will restore the fortunes of Elam in the days to come, declares the Lord. There are six key points of God's judgment mentioned in the oracle against Elam. The first is I will break the bow of Elam, the mainstay of their might. Second, I will bring against Elam the four winds from the four quarters of heaven. Throughout the scriptures, the four winds equals war. Third, I will scatter them to the four winds, and there will not be a nation where Elam's exiles do not go. Fourth, I will shatter Elam before their foes, before those who want to kill them. And fifth, I will bring disaster on them, even my fierce anger declares the Lord. And sixth, I will pursue them with the sword until I have made an end of them. Wow, God sure has it out for Elam. But where is Elam anyway? Elam, it turns out, is in southwestern Iran or Persia. In its day, the capital city was Susa. And the Elamite history dates back to around 2700 B.C. And one of the best preserved ziggurats, the Choga Zanbil, lies just about 50 miles out of the ancient city of Susa. And later, Elamites joined the Assyrians and, following that, the Babylonians in attacking Israel, hence garnering God's ire. Finally, the Medes and the Persians conquered Elam about 587 B.C. or so. The prophet Ezekiel laments over Elam in Ezekiel 32, 24. 
But somehow Elam reemerges in the last days only to be destroyed by God. So why and how does Elam emerge in the last days? Elam basically represents Iran in general, since Iran did not exist in Jeremiah's and Ezekiel's days. But specifically, Elam is very important in the end time scenario. Located in this region is the infamous Bashir nuclear power plant, where much of the nuclear fuel is being produced to manufacture the nuclear weapons Iran is building. Iraq tried to destroy this power plant in 1988, but Russia signed on in 1995 to rebuild and complete the plant, and it began operations in 2010. Also located just off the coast of Bashur is Karg Island, a huge refinery and petroleum terminal where 98% of Iran's oil exports take off from. And this is one of the most important areas Israel and the West will attack should war begin with Iran, because it will cripple Iran and the nuclear fallout alone from the destruction of the Bashir nuclear power plant would devastate much of Iran. And the destruction of Karg Island would bring Iran to its knees economically and cause oil prices to skyrocket around the world. So here is the location of the ancient empire of Elam. And here is where the Bashur nuclear power plant and city are located. And just off the coast is Karg Island that has Iran's Navy base and a huge refinery and terminal where 98% of the oil from Iran is exported from. So what is to become of Elam? If you recall, in the prophecy in Jeremiah it says I will set my throne in Elam and destroy her king and officials declares the Lord yet I will restore the fortunes of Elam in the days to come declares the Lord interestingly the Lord will destroy the government and its officials and then place his throne there he will go on to restore the fortunes of Elam and there are only two places in the Bible that talks about where the Lord is said to have his throne. The first is in Jerusalem, and the second is in Elam. The remnant of Elam will be his people, and he will be their God. Finally, there is one last thing I'd like to discuss that is prophetically occurring right now in Israel and that is the discovery of petroleum. <laughs> so you might be asking, well how is the discovery of petroleum going to play in the end times with Israel? Well let's read in Ezekiel 38 11 through 13 in the English Standard Version. It says, verse 11, and say, I will go up against the land of unwalled villages. I will fall upon the quiet people who dwell securely all of them dwelling without walls and having no bars or gates, to seize spoil and to carry off plunder, to turn your hand against the waste places that are now inhabited, and the people who were gathered from the nations who have acquired livestock and goods who dwell at the center of the earth, Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish, and all its leaders will say to you, Have you come to see spoil? Have you assembled your hosts to carry off plunder, to carry away silver and gold, to take away livestock and goods, to seize great spoil? Notice the focus is on spoil. <laughs> Have you seen Israel lately? It looks pretty desolate, and it doesn't appear to be much, quote, spoil, unquote, there. <laughs> At least nothing that should cause the leader of the final beast empire to attack Israel until just very recently. In January 2012, Noble Energy announced a huge find of natural gas in the Cypress Block 12 field. Here is the announcement from the company. Noble Energy discovers gas offshore Cypress, January 10, 2012. Houston, Noble Energy Incorporated recently announced a natural gas discovery at the Cypress Block 12 prospect offshore the Republic of Cypress.
The Cypress A1 well encountered approximately 310 feet of net natural gas pay in multiple high-quality Miocene sand intervals. The discovery well was drilled to a depth of 19,225 feet in water depth of about 5,540 feet. Results from drilling, formation logs, and initial evaluation work indicate an estimated gross resource range of 5 to 8 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. Charles D. Davidson went on to say, this is the fifth consecutive natural gas field discovery for Noble Energy and our partners in the Greater Levant Basin, with total gross mean resources for the five discoveries currently estimated to be over 33 trillion cubic feet. That is a lot of natural gas. So here is the area where natural gas has been found between Cyprus and Israel. It is known as the Levant Basin Province. For the longest time, Israel has been bereft of the fact that they seem to be the only nation throughout the entire Middle East that has not had any oil. But the president of Noble Energy, who happens to be Christian, believed that prophecy in Ezekiel 38. And he believed that he would find oil in and around Israel. And so he has been searching for years for it. And here are the fields that they have found all of this natural gas right off of the coast of Israel. The previous slide spoke of the Cyprus Block 12 site, but note there are eight other sites right around just off the coast of Israel where they have found up to 33 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. As you can imagine, all that natural gas off the coast of Israel has caught the attention of several people. In fact, in an article in Forbes magazine on Forbes.com by Ken Silverstein in April 2013, he says, It's a game changer, not just for Israel, but potentially in the geopolitical and economic chess game. It provides Israel with more energy security while the gas could also be exported to needy countries. And that leads to the second reason for the visit of the head of Noble Oil, Charles Davidson, which is whether the gas will stay mostly in Israel or whether it will head to Eastern or Western Europe, as well as certain Middle Eastern or North African nations such as Jordan and South Sudan. His newfound wealth is helping to build friendships. Russia has long been the major supplier of natural gas to all of Europe, providing about 23% of the continent's needs. Russia holds about 27.5% of the world's gas supply, says the U.S. Energy Information Administration. That's why Russia is now cozying up to Israel, as it wants to distribute that potential natural gas to its partners. So who else, besides Europe and Russia may be taking notice of this new source of quote spoil unquote from Israel. Well, possibly all the surrounding Muslim nations, huh? And perhaps the future leader of the final eight nation beast empire. Hmm. Thank you for watching chapter three. As you can see, the prophetic clock seems to be ticking again. So please continue on to chapter 4 for the last chapter of part 3 on my study of Daniel's 70th week prophecy. In chapter 4 we'll discuss the leader and the treaty and have a part 3 review. If you like it, tell somebody. I do appreciate your taking the time to watch my videos on the 70th week of Daniel. And if you think they offer insights that others can benefit from, can you please do two things for me? First, share them. Let's get the word out to your friends, family, and church that there are signs that we should be watching for that may indicate that we are very close to the culmination of this age. And second, please like my videos. Those little thumbs up signs are really important. And it does help others to see that people like you find these helpful to the end time discussion. God bless and Godspeed.